In this video, we will demonstrate the GoBack MLAB that we did uh, most recently in class. This was actually done via uh, C++. Um, the work that we did to the lab uh, in class was done in the studentwork.cpp file, which I have also uploaded onto my blog uh, for your consideration. Uh, but we'll start somewhere else for the time being. Uh, we have a header file titled rdt dot dot h, um, which really just stands to initialize some variables and some of the things that we will use in the file. Uh, rdt dot cpp, on the other hand, um, actually is is what we kind of refer to as the black box. It's what's going to output. Um, it's so what's really going to do all of our outputs for us and things like that. Uh, we have uh, the messages that will be outputted into our um, into our command line. Uh, this is what we'll see. These uh, lines in red right here. Uh, if you come down, we have um, what will generate the next arrival of the packet. We have what will. Uh, cause um, each event. Uh, we have the starting and stopping of the timeout timer done in this area. There's the start timer right here and the uh, stop timer there. Um, if we continue on, go into the header file. These are just the objects that we will initialize in the studentwork.cpp file. Uh, this pragma once explains that if we already have used the files, um, not to worry about duplicates. Uh, it really just states that we're only going to use these files once. Uh, we're only going to define these files once. Um, other than that, they should just kind of be ignored. Uh, here in the studentwork.cpp file, we have our global variables um, for the first part, which comes from a lot of this comes from. Uh, chapter 3.4, page 221 in our book, um, Computer Networking, a Top-Down Approach by Kuros, um, or Kurosi. You can see our global variables include a base, a next sequence number, um, the number of packets to go back in the event that a um, packet is lost or corrupted. Five, uh, the maximum number of packets we're going we could simulate, which is 100. Uh, the payload size, which is going to be the number of bits we're going to send. In this case, we use 20. Uh, the timeout in seconds, which will also be 20. Uh, you can see at the initialization, the base will be one, and the next sequence number will be one. Um, the output uh, we have that the next sequence number as long as it's less than the base plus n um, and we will uh, we will send packets and then you'll add to the um, you'll add to the sequence number and things of that nature uh, it will calculate the checksum uh, and set the checksum number for the next packet uh, which will ensure that the packets are arriving in the correct order um, we have an input which is just uh, the packet. If the checksum is not equal to the expected checksum, it's going to be a bad checksum on ACK. It will skip the sending or it will skip that packet. Um, we have the starting and stopping of the timer uh, to ensure that the uh, the packets don't reach timeout. Uh, timer interrupt. Which will again, or which will check the timeout. Again, uh, this is for the receiver packets. We have uh, a check for a bad checksum. We have uh, an unexpected sequence number. In which case, it'll ask for a uh, duplicate act to be sent. Um, we have what will be really included in the packet payload um, and the checksum. Uh, we are not doing for the receiver a timeout period, um, just a bad checksum from the 
from the receiver packet. Again, we just uh, declare the payload. Um, so we will now demonstrate the running of the lab. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is just a base case. In this case, we're only going to set one packet. We're going to assume that there's zero packet loss and zero corruption. Uh, we'll say the average time between packets is going to be five seconds, and the trace will set to five. Uh, now you can see the packet was sent. Um, the message given on the other side was all eight, um, and there's 20 of them because that's what's in our payload. Uh, the next packet would have been sent at 5.96 seconds. Uh, however, after the first packet arrived at Point or at the first layer, um, at the sender at point four six seconds. Uh, the next packet will arrive to the sender at eight seconds. Um, and the first packet arrives at the receiver at five seconds. Um, and then you can see that the future time will be twenty seconds because the packet's already arrived, um, and therefore. Um, the next time, and we only sent one, so the next time the packet would be expected uh, wouldn't be until this timeout ended uh, because we're no longer expecting any more packets. Um, so now we'll try a little bit bigger size um, in order to maybe see some more things happen. So now we'll just uh, we'll get away from the base case, but we're still going to assume zero packet loss. Uh, so we're going to send 8 packets this time, just to see a little bit more. Uh, assume 0 packet loss and 0 corruption. Again, 5 seconds between the packets and a trace of 3. Um, so this time we can see that we're getting a lot more data through. Uh, we have A's being sent around the same time period. Um, and then the next packet arrives at the second layer at 8 seconds, which we can see it would from the first packet. Uh, this time it includes all B's, um, and it's received on the other side at 9.43 seconds. So now we go down. Um, again, we're not losing any packets, so we're just kind of going in order here. So we get uh, the C the packet that includes all C's. Uh, this one is received at the sending layer at 11.6, which we can see it should have by this 11.6. Uh, in the packet that it contained all bees. Um, it's sent across to the other side and now we're expecting the next packet at 15.6 or 15.106. Um, so we get C's and then D's are sent and then it starts over. Um, so now we're gonna try to make it a little more interesting by including some packet loss or uh, corruption and the first time we're just gonna use packet loss um, to kind of show the differences. So we'll s assume eight packets being sent again and 50% packet loss this time as denoted by 0.5. Uh, 0% corruption again. We're going to assume five seconds between each packet and a trace of three. Uh, so this time we should see some packets being lost. Uh, for example, the A's are or the first packet which includes all A's is received. However, there is a packet lost um, on the way to layer three. Um, the packet, the B packet, is lost um, on its way over to the student. Uh, the C packet appears to be successfully received. Uh, the E's are also lost, which is the fifth packet we tried to send on the way to the students. Um, so now we try to we start over and we send A's again. Um, both B's and C's are lost, as you can see from from these two messages right here. Uh, so we skip down and then the D packets are sent. So now we will try to uh, just try to see if we can send packets without loss, but this time the packets will be corrupted. Um, on the way. So we'll send eight packets again. We'll assume zero percent loss, but fifty percent corruption. Uh, say five seconds between and a trace of three. 
Um, now if I'm on this one, uh, you can see that the second bracket is corrupted, um, which is, uh, the B packet is corrupted before it gets the student, um, C, the packet that contains C's has also been corrupted, as well as the packet that contains D's. Uh, so, so far, I think the only packet that hasn't been corrupted is just the A packet. Um, so, we go down here. Again, all the packets are corrupted in this section. Um, so, you can see that just at 50% corruption, we actually get a lot of corruption within the files. Um, and it really hinders our sending ability. Um, you have the A sent correctly here. The B's again are the B packet is corrupted. The C packet is sent correctly. The D packet is corrupted. Um, so all those packets will have to be resent uh, eventually in order to ensure that the receiver is actually getting the right information. Um, so now we're going to try and run the simulation with both packet loss and corruption and just see how greatly that affects our ability to send packets. So again, we're going to send eight messages. Uh, we're going to assume 50% on both packet loss and corruption. Uh, you can actually see screenshots of all of the different ways I've tried to run this simulator, uh, again, on my blog. But if we assume, um, again, the average time between senders is five seconds. And we do a trace of three. Uh, we should see a bit of everything in this packet successfully sent, uh, corrupted, and uh, lost packets. So, for example, A is successfully sent. However, uh, there is a lost packet here. Uh, B is lost, and C is corrupted. Um, so we have B, B being lost here, and C being corrupted here. Um, so we have bad checksums. We have lost packets. Uh, just pretty much, the packets are greatly affected, or the just the ability to send is so greatly affected um, by the uh, just the fifty percent for each one. Um, we have a successfully sent packet for the A's, uh, but the B's are corrupted. The C's are lost. Uh, the D packet is corrupted. Uh, so if you really just see, uh, I mean, even 50% for each is such a greatly, um, just greatly affects our ability to uh, to send and receive with success from the receiver to the packet, uh, or to, from the sender to the receiver. So again, um, all of these labs have been post, or all of these screenshots have been posted to my blog, um, along with this commented out version of studentwork.cpp. Uh, if you'd like to see those, again, it's WordPress forward slash Maxwell Sullivan. Um, and uh, enjoy. Thank you.